So what if you got an email from Netflix and they announced that for 2023, every subscription to Netflix is absolutely free to every single person who is willing to accept that gift. Now, that would be a, for many of us, a, a pretty good gift. It would be a good savings. But if I got an email that said Netflix is absolutely free if you click this link, I would be a little bit suspicious because if you're like me and you've clicked a link before that was, you know, a phishing, a scam, you end up all kinds of things happen. You got to change out this and that and change numbers and passwords. I'd want to verify that that's true, right? If you got an email that said Netflix is 100% free for the entire year of 2023, I would want to verify it. Now, let's just say that we verified that this was actually not fake news, but real. And we got a free subscription to Netflix for an entire year. After we verified it, I would celebrate it because after all, that's a pretty good gift. But then I would share it. Now, some of you would put it on Facebook right away because everything we think we put right on Facebook and social media, right? But some of us would just our close friends, we would share it because this is news that's just simply too good not to share. I may call my sons and go, hey, Netflix is free for a year. I'm going to send you the link, right? I, of course, would tell Joy, maybe the staff. And eventually, I'd want to share with everybody because after all, this free gift is worth verifying that it's true. Once we decided that it's true, it's certainly worth celebrating. And anything that's worth celebrating is worth sharing once we decide that it's good news. But good news is only good news if we accept this news, if we allow it to be good news, if we celebrate the fact that it's good news and we're willing to share this good news. What if... God's plan for your life is a little different than your plan for your life. What if God has something else in mind? Let's look together at a couple of thoughts that I want to give you as we get started this morning on this Christmas teaching time. This, I can't believe it's seven days until Christmas. Seven days is just a week until Christmas. You probably have noticed the different Christmas sweaters that are around the room here. Have you noticed that? It's not just that we've all lost our marbles and, and have decided to, to dress uh, in a tacky sort of festive way. We call this Christmas sweater Sunday. We used to call it ugly Christmas sweater. Two years ago, I got in trouble for that because I called it ugly Christmas sweater Sunday. And I went to a nice lady who was seated right over here on the aisle and she had a Christmas sweater that in her estimation wasn't ugly. But I thought since it was the day, that I should compliment it as being an ugly sweater. And I said, boy, that's a great, ugly Christmas sweater. And I didn't make her feel very welcome at Capital City Church. That's just not the kind of church we are. So it's Christmas sweater day today. So if you happen to have a sweater on, the, yeah, that, that would be an ugly one, I'm pretty sure. Um, you know, in the spirit of Christmas vacation, I had to wear my Clark W. Griswold jersey. So each to their own, right? Christmas is one week away. We're celebrating this good news. What if being a part of God's plan means a disruption to your plan? Now, everybody has a tendency to be churchy and say, oh, no big deal. If God has a plan for me, of course I'm going to do it. Of course I'm going to like it. But I want you to just walk with me for a second. I want you to assume that God has a specific plan for you in your life, one that he designed for you before you were born, one that only you can fulfill. And perhaps you've been living out this plan, but perhaps you have not. And maybe you are willing to accept that there may be a day coming when God reveals to you what his plan for your life is. And it's going to be a little different than the way you visualized your life being. And you have to make a choice. Do I want God's way or do I want my way? Now, it seems like an easy question to answer. Of course, I want God's way. But what if God's way is different than my way? What if it's scary? What if it's unknown? What if I can't control it? What if it brings peace and freedom that I've never experienced before? What if at the end, I'll leave this life behind without regret? What if, if I choose God's plan, when I leave this life behind and open my eyes instantly to the reality of heaven, I'll hear Jesus say, welcome home, you were good and faithful. But what if God's plan is a little different than yours? What are you going to do about it? Remember last week we talked about Ecclesiastes 3, that God has made everything beautiful in its time. He's also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. So God has put within us the desire for eternity and that you and I have to find this desire and we have to pursue this desire as it lines up with God's plan. The angel appeared to the shepherds recorded in the book of Luke and told them that Jesus' story was going to intersect with their story and our story, bringing context to the chaos and illuminating the eternity that was written in their hearts. 
We're going to pick up the Christmas story and we're going to look at it through the eyes of the shepherds today. For them, there was a night that changed everything. The plans they had for their life, they aligned with God's plans for their life. They accepted a new mission, a new worldview, a new passion. They found this peace and this freedom and this hope that I'm talking about. And that's what I want you to find as well. In the days of Caesar Augustus, or in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. It's the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. And he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available. Now, we talked about this last week. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Three things, good news, great joy for all people. Now, this is what I want you to consider today. If it's good news, it's worth verifying. If it's verified, it's worth celebrating. If it's worth celebrating, it's worth sharing. The angel said, I bring you good news that will give you great joy and it's for all people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you and you will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Well, let's talk for a second about this good news. The angel said, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. But let's look at these three things. Now, when the baby was born, walk with me here, the baby was just a baby. Now, it wasn't just a baby in the fact that he was just a human baby. He was 100% God and 100% man. It was Jesus, the Messiah, who came to earth in the form of a human baby. But the baby had not done anything yet. Jesus, the baby, was just a baby. The good news that had been brought to the shepherds was good news should they choose to accept it but it was good news that was changing everything and wouldn't be revealed until Jesus began his ministry 30 years later. So the shepherds had to believe in something yet that was still to come. You and I get to look back on an event that has already happened and understand the good news. But for us, we have to look at Jesus and what he did to see why in fact this was good news, why it brought great joy and why it was for all people. I had a meeting this last week, a coffee with a friend of mine who's older than me. And I always enjoy most of the time meeting with people who are older than me. And when I say older, old enough to be my dad, wise, he's um, been around, had a, a lot of life, a lot of experiences and uh, experiences that are very different than mine. And we were just kind of talking about our lives. And he was talking a little bit about the way he was brought up and what brought him back to church. And he said, you know, Rick, he said, I was raised in a church where my parents, they made me attend three times a week. And he said, there was kind of a church police that looked at everybody, scrutinized behavior, tried to enforce compliance, very concerned about what we did and didn't do. Never really felt good enough to really belong. Always felt a little off balance. And he said, I don't really blame church. He said, I just didn't have any use for it. You see, it was good news. It just wasn't good news for him. And the reason it wasn't good news for him is because he happened to be part of a church, a religious organization that was more interested in compliance and enforcement and control than it was in freedom and grace and purpose. And he said, Rick, it took me 70 years to come back to church. And he said, I'm interested in grace. 
I'm interested in purpose. He said, it has to be more than just the rules. Now, it's good news if we understand the gospel, but perhaps some of us have heard a different version of the gospel that has not been good news at all. So I want you to look at the correct version of the gospel. Now, I don't want you to, to look at me and go, oh, Rick thinks he knows something everybody else doesn't know. I want you to look at the Bible and I want you to see the version of the gospel from Jesus Christ himself. And I want you to see why it's good news, why it brings great joy and why it's for all the people. Let's break this down together. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. That's the Old Testament and the Old Testament laws. The Pharisees were really good. There were about 6,000 of them about the time of Jesus. They were very good at enforcing the rules, very good at controlling uh, the church, very good at making everything about them. Very good at you never quite knowing how you, how you fit, how you measured up. Very good at telling you the things you should do and the things you should avoid. Very good at keeping score. Now, the Old Testament law, they had made or bent around their will and certainly not God's and church and religion had become something just very different than what Jesus had ever intended. But the Old Testament law was proclaimed until John. Since that time, the good news of the kingdom, since John the Baptist, is being preached and everybody is forcing their way into it. And so the Bible literally says that this good news, once the gospel is understood the way Jesus intended it, causes people to run from the legalism and the restrictions and the enforcement of the past and to embrace the grace and the forgiveness and the freedom that comes from choosing to follow Jesus, that it's truly good news. I was thinking about Luke chapter five, thinking about a story where Jesus called Simon Peter. Jesus was teaching, he was preaching. Simon Peter allowed him to use his boat and Jesus got tired as anybody would and dispersed the crowds after a while. And Peter was kind of a skeptic. He was sort of hard-headed. He was impulsive like you and me and had a lot of questions. And he was just getting to know Jesus. And Jesus wanted Peter to understand that he was good news that brings great joy for all people. See, Peter was confused like many of the Jews of Jesus' day. And Jesus took him fishing. He said, let's just you and I go fishing together. And a miracle happened and Peter caught a ton of fish. And he said, you clearly are God. And he said, you have to go away from me because I am not your kind of person. So here's Rick's paraphrase. You read the story for yourself in Luke chapter five. Jesus in this boat, put his arm around Peter and smiled at him and said, relax. Who told you this was supposed to be hard? Now, denying yourself and following Jesus, it requires sacrifice, but stop working so hard. He said, follow me. And the Bible says, Peter's like, all right, I'm gonna take you up on your word. Not 100% sure what you mean, but let's do it. And Jesus says, I'll make you a fisher of men. So off Peter went. Amazing stories happen in Luke chapter five. Jesus healed a leper, touched him, sent him off and said, don't tell anybody what I've done. But then Jesus shows up at a house in Capernaum and we don't know whose house it is. Maybe Peter's, it was a nice house, so maybe not Peter's, who knows. Houses in Jesus' day oftentimes weren't big enough to host a large crowd, but this one apparently was. There were maximum capacity crowds in this house. Probably the Pharisees and the scribes crowded in. Anybody else who could possibly be in there and hear Jesus. There were four friends who had a paralyzed friend who was unable to move and was confined to a bed. The Bible says that these four friends tried to get into the meeting where Jesus was because they wanted their friend to see Jesus more than anything else. They couldn't get in the door because it was too crowded. So they moved around to look in the windows. They checked the back door. There was no way to get in. And the people weren't moving because the Pharisees and the church, the religious leaders of the day, they were more important than a, a paralyzed man. They weren't gonna move. 
So the Bible says that they went to the roof, that they dug through the tiles and they begin to lower their friend down to Jesus. Now think about the mechanics of this, just the engineering, lowering their friend just to the right spot. Jesus wasn't upset. When the man was lowered to the ground, Jesus looked at him and he said, your sins are forgiven. Now, the man was probably interested in his sins being forgiven, but also interested in being healed. The Pharisees were very upset and said, Jesus, you can't forgive sins. And Jesus said, what's harder, forgiving sins or having somebody healing them and making them walk? And then he looked at the man and he said, get up and walk, you're healed. So the man got up, folded up his mat and took off walking and leaping and praising God, full of joy because he was healed spiritually and his physical needs were met. So then Jesus finished teaching and was walking through town and ran into another person who would later become his disciple, Matthew, a person who actually wrote one of our gospels that we, that we read about in scripture. It was a tax collector, thug, common street thug, three levels of tax collectors. He was the bottom level. Jesus says, follow me. And Matthew said, you don't want me. I'm not your kind of person. And Jesus, this is the way I visualize it, put his arm around Matthew and said, you're exactly my kind of person. You don't know where I've been. Jesus says, yeah, I do. You don't know what I've done. And Jesus says, yes, I do. And Matthew says, you don't want me to follow you. And Jesus says, yes, I do. So Matthew said, all right, where are we going to go? And Jesus said, to your house. And so Jesus went to a party at Matthew's house where Matthew had all of his friends who weren't fit for church, who the church police had summarily put down. And Jesus reclined at the table along with the people who weren't good enough for Jesus. The Pharisees stood outside whispering among themselves. And Jesus says, listen, I didn't come for those people who think they're healthy, the obnoxious, self-satisfied, self-sufficient, legalistic, judgmental, for the super churchy. I came for those who know they're sick. For all people, I came to free you from yourself, from Satan, from perhaps some form of religion or maybe even Christianity. I've come to free you and to give you a purpose and a future that might be different from the one you've envisioned for yourself. But before I ask you to follow me, I want you to know who I am that I am good news, that you can verify, trustworthy, that you can celebrate. And once you verify and celebrate, then naturally, you want to share it. But for them, and perhaps for you, it's a totally different way of thinking. But that's okay. Because we call it the walk of uncommon faith. We're going to sing a couple songs and I'm going to come back and finish this story and maybe apply this a little bit. Angels, where was I? Angels, yeah. <laughs> angels played an important part in the Christmas story. And, you know, angels, as I mentioned to you last week, were created in an order. And right now their order is a little higher than humans, so they know a little more than we do. Part of the reason is because of their proximity to God. Part of the reason is because they study and understand Scripture because of their proximity to God. And part of it is that they've been able to observe humankind since we were created, seeing how it is that God interacts with us and um, how we interact with him. Watching God's blessing, his forgiveness, watching his promises, watching him keep his promises. The angels have uh, an order and there's kind of a hierarchy. We see the archangel, 
we see Michael, we see the, the primary chief messenger, Gabriel. We see two different types of angels, at least. We see the, the cherubim that were primarily responsible for guarding God's holiness. We're not exactly sure why that was necessary or how that works. And then the seraphim who were uh, really responsible for proclaiming together uh, the greatness of God. And we see the greatness of God being proclaimed in this story right now to the shepherds. Now, I want you to understand that everybody, when Jesus was born, everybody who had anything to do with Judaism was not a bad person. That there were faithful people, they were a remnant by this time, looking forward to the Messiah. It's just that the church, Judaism, the people who controlled the church, had been corrupt for generations. And they had chosen to make everything about them and their family and what they wanted. So religion served them and it failed to serve the world. It had no longer become good news for anybody except those that were on the inside. A very small, controlling, comfortable group of people. So when Jesus came onto the scene, a lot of his teaching contrasted the common teaching of the church because of the leaders and how different he was and why this news was good, why it brought great joy. And the most scandalous and, and important and exciting thing was that it was for all people. Let's look together. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. God's story intersected with their story and they had to choose. Their plan for their lives was very different than God's plan for their life and they had to choose. The good news of the person of Jesus was to bring great joy and given and shared for all people. So the shepherds, just like you and I, they had to choose, what am I to do? Now, here's where I get worried because I feel like I'm going to sound churchy. And I don't want you for one second to feel like I'm being churchy when I tell you to go do what the shepherds did. Because what did the shepherds do after all? I mean, the shepherds, when they had left them and gone, or the angels had left them and gone, the shepherds said, let's go see what had happened, this thing that the Lord has told us about, and let's see what the shepherds chose to do. So they hurried off. They found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And then when they'd seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them. So before they knew, a day just like any other. After they knew, they had to choose what tomorrow was going to look like. Remember my friend I told you about, one of our church family who I hung out with this last week, said it took him almost seven decades to come back and kind of give this another shot, another chance. He said to me, he said, Rick, he said, I'm concerned, I'm worried. I said, what are you concerned about? He said, I'm worried about missing my purpose in life. He said, look at all the years I may have wasted. What if I miss my purpose? Now here is where you have to choose. I said, tell me about your life. What do you do? He's retired. He's got hobbies, take up a lot of time. And he said, well, I've got this friend who's not able to walk right now, known him for years, said, I'll pick him up, take him to appointments, go to the chiropractor, we go to the doctor, I go to hy V. I I buy him groceries, he called me this morning, couldn't get his trash out because we had some ice on the, on the driveway and said, I went over and I took his trash out. And he said, he can't really do a lot of things for himself. He said, so I help him. And I said, well, why do you help him? And he said, well, it's what we're supposed to do, right? It's what Jesus would do. And I said, yeah. And he said, but I'm worried I'm going to miss my purpose. 
And so it was fun for me to be able to draw short lines, right, between somebody's question and concern and the reality of their life that they may not be able to see. And I said, it seems to me that if you're using your influence in somebody else's life to show them who Jesus is, that's your purpose. That's like the shepherds, how they went and they told. That's like the story in Luke chapter 5. The Bible says, and look this up, you can trust me, but verify, right? That's what we're supposed to do when anybody tells you the Bible says something. That when these four friends lowered their friend down on a mat, and their friend, the paralyzed man who had a physical need and a spiritual need, the spiritual being far greater than the physical, even if he didn't realize it. Jesus says, this is what I've, you look this up, Luke chapter five. When Jesus saw their faith, not just his faith, their faith, he healed him. He saved him. He allowed him to go and live a life filled with good news that brought great joy for a person just like him. You don't have to be Billy Graham and you don't have to be Mother Teresa. You don't have to be in line to be sainted or knighted or whatever it is you think we do to super Christians. You don't have to walk in a way where your feet don't touch the ground. You don't have to ever do a miracle. You just have to be like the four friends. They use their influence. They use their ingenuity. They use their resources. And I'm guessing a little bit of luck to guess the exact spot to dig a hole in a roof to do whatever it took to make an introduction for a person they loved to Jesus. Jesus did the rest. There's nothing churchy about it. The church exists to live the life of the four friends. The church together will not quit. Coming alongside people who are lost and hurting and doing whatever it takes to introduce them to Jesus every day, all day, until Jesus comes again. Because we understand this good news that gives somebody like me joy. Somebody who I wouldn't choose if I were God but because God is loving and merciful and gracious, he let me in. So stop making it so hard. Let's leave our former lives behind and just like the shepherds, go and share this message with anybody. Just like the four friends. Make the introduction with the people who God's put in our life. Be relentless and gracious and gentle as you allow God to supernaturally insert you into the faith story of the people who you love. That's the message of Christmas. It's exactly what Jesus did by being born a baby and living this human experience so that you and I could be free. Let me pray for you. We'll sing a last song. And I trust that this Christmas will be better and different than any you may have had before. Father, thank you for my friends.